Yesterday on Through the Bible, we studied six of the eight benefits of salvation that are available to believers here on earth. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to Romans chapter 5, verses 9 to 21, where we'll hear about the last two benefits and move into a study of how a believer can be sanctified, or set apart, for God. In just a few minutes, you'll hear Dr. McGee mention his audio series called Reasoning Through Romans. You can listen to it or download it online at ttb.org. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover on the Bible bus today, so let's pray and get right to our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many gifts that you give us, especially our salvation through Jesus. We pray for those listening who don't yet know him, and we would ask you to draw them close and speak to their hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, we saw there were eight benefits, and we were able only to look at six of those benefits last time, and we come today in verse 9 to the seventh benefit, and that's deliverance from the great tribulation. Notice what he says, much more than being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, the wrath that is mentioned here is the wrath that the scripture speaks of. The great day of his wrath is come. The prophet Zephaniah used that term in Zephaniah 1.14. What is the great day of wrath? Well, the great day of wrath that is coming, the Lord Jesus called it the great tribulation. And he tells the believer here that he is saved from wrath. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. And he's constantly saving us today from the power of sin. But he's going to save us in the future from the presence of sin. And that means that every believer will go out at the rapture and will go out not because he's worthy, because he's not worthy, but because he's been saved by the grace of God. And he'll be taken out by the grace of God. We're saved by grace. We live by the grace of God. And not 10,000, but 10 million years from today, we'll be in heaven by the grace of God. We are saved from wrath through him. And now notice verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, he died down here to save us. He lives up yonder to keep us saved. Now he mentions the eighth benefit here in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've received not the atonement, but the reconciliation. Now we just joy in God. I think this is one of the most wonderful statements that we have in this section. It just means right now, wherever you are, whatever your problems are, My friend, you can just joy, that is, rejoice in God. Just think of it. You can rejoice that he's who he is, that he lives. We can rejoice that he's provided a salvation for us, that he's willing to save us sinners and bring us into his presence, and he's worked out a plan because of his love for us. Now, isn't that enough to make you rejoice? That's a benefit. Oh, the child of God should have joy in his heart. Now, he doesn't have to go around smiling like a Cheshire cat, but he sure ought to have joy in his heart. I love that song that's out today. It's a rather new song. Let's just praise the Lord. We have that on a cassette tape, and at night sometimes after we get in bed, my wife and I just play it. Let's just praise the Lord. Now, these are the eight benefits that Paul mentions here. Now, we come to this next section 
here in Romans, beginning at verse 12 of chapter 5, and that's sanctification of the saint. And that'll take us through the 8th chapter. Now, will you notice as we come here, this is a new section in the epistle to the Romans. You remember the first section had to do with the subject of sin. Then salvation was the subject. And we have seen the salvation of the sinner. Now we're coming to the sanctification of the saint because God in salvation only declares the sinner righteous. Nothing has happened inside of the individual to make him better. But God is going to make him better. And so we find that in sanctification we have a work of God. Whereas in salvation it was an act of God. Now in this section we're coming to, I've labeled potential sanctification. That's the remainder of chapter 5. We have here a subject that I think you'll find it difficult. You'll find it difficult in two ways. I find it difficult to understand. I find it difficult to accept. This is probably the hardest doctrine for any Christian, especially having heard it for the first time, to accept it and to believe it. Now, in potential sanctification, here in this fifth chapter, we have what is known as the federal headship of Adam and Christ. I want to talk about that for just a moment. And I recognize I'm getting theological now. But let's notice the mechanics of the rest of the chapter. In verses 12 through 14, you have the headship of Adam. Death and sin came through him. Then you have the headship of Christ. And life and righteousness came through him. That's verses 15 and 17. Then you have finally, in this chapter, the offense of Adam versus the righteousness of Christ. And that's in verses 18 through 21. All right, now let's look at this question of the headship of Adam. Through him came to the race sin and death. And I'd like to read... Verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now I trust you have our notes and outlines of Romans, and better still, I hope many of you felt that you'd like to have part in supporting our program, and you've sent for our first volume on reasoning through Romans. And I have in this volume through this section, my own translation of the verses that we're considering. That is where we think that by translating, we can bring out the meaning a little bit better. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do not recommend this translation at all. The fact of the matter is, we call it here in Southern California, the Magiacus Ad Absurdum translation. Nobody ought to use it. But now listen to it as we have it here and I think that probably we can widen out our understanding of this section. On this account, that is the plan of salvation for all by one Redeemer, just as through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread throughout upon all men on the ground of the fact that all sin. Now we need to understand here that the sin we're talking about is not the sin that you and I commit that brings death. It's the sin of Adam, that first sin of Adam. Not his second one or his third one, his fourth one, but that first sin. Disobedience in the Garden of Eden brought death upon all of his progeny, all of his offspring. Now, that brings me back to consider something that's very important, and that is the fact that you and I are sinners, as we said, in four different ways. And that means that you and I are sinners because we commit acts of sin. But we're sinners by nature because sin doesn't make us sinners, but we sin because we are sinners. We have that nature. And then we have seen already we're under sin. We're in the state of sin. God has declared the entire human family under sin. But you and I are also sinners by imputation. Now, that is, Adam acted for the human race. That means he was the head of it, and he acted for the human race, and it's on the basis of that federal headship of Adam that now God is able through the federal headship of Christ to save those that will trust Christ. Well, I reckon that this is a little difficult, but let's stick with it. Let's hang in there. Now, this is what the theologians have labeled 
the federal headship. Let me say just a word about it and see if we can't probably understand it. Adam and Christ are representatives of the human race. Adam is the natural head of the human race. And by the way, I accept that. I saw a bumper sticker that interests me a great deal. I liked it. It says, my ancestors were human. Sorry about yours. <laughs> and may I say that this lays in the dust any idea that you can be a Christian and believe in the Word of God today and also accept evolution. Adam is the head of the human family. That's what Paul is saying here. He's the natural head. And his one act of disobedience plunged his entire offspring into sin. We're all made sinners by Adam's sins. Now, this doesn't mean that we have a sinful nature inherited from Adam. Now, that's true. I got a sinful nature from my father and he from his father and on back. And I passed that on to my child. And now I have two grandchildren. And that first one was such a wonderful little fella. I was beginning to think that maybe there wasn't any such thing as the total depravity of man. But that little fella grew up, and I got another one. He's red-headed, and boy, does he have a temper. And I want to say to you that I now believe in the total depravity of man again because I've seen a manifestation in those two little fellas of something that they got from their grandmother, I think. But may I say to you that you and I have a sinful nature. But that sin of Adam was made over to us also, and we can prove it. Now, this doesn't mean that we're all either guilty of a sinful act. We are, but that's not what he's talking about here. When he says all have sinned, we've sinned in Adam. It does mean that we're so vitally connected with the first father of the human race that before we even had a human nature or had committed a sin, even before we were born, we were sinners in Adam. Now, maybe you don't like that, but that's the way God has put it. We're just like the Scripture has an illustration of that. You remember we're told that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek long before he was born. How did he do it? Well, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 7, 9, And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. Now, Adam's sin therefore is imputed unto us. What Adam did, we did. Now, God could put all of us in a Garden of Eden after Adam had sinned, and we would have had a sinful nature. Do you think that we could have done any better in the Garden of Eden with a sinful nature than Adam did without a sinful nature? I don't think so. He disobeyed God. His one act of disobedience made us all that. Now, somebody says, I don't like that. You don't like that? Well, let me illustrate that again by something that you do accept, I believe. For instance, my grandfather lived in North Island. He was Scottish. And they fought back in his day. He didn't like it. So he emigrated to this country. He left Northern Ireland. He came to the United States, settled first in Georgia. Now what my grandfather did, I did. When he left Northern Ireland, I left Northern Ireland. And I thank God he left, friends. I sure appreciate what Grandpa did for me. Now, if you want to know the truth, when he came to this country, what he did, I did. I was in him. And the reason that I'm born in this country is because of what he has done. In that way, Adam's sin is imputed to us. Now we are already seen that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us by the death of Christ. Christ is the head of a new race, a new redeemed man, and the church is his body, a new creation. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. She is his new creation by water and the blood. The church is a new creation. It's a new race. And now this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 and then 47. So it's written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Notice, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, there will not be a third Adam, for Christ is the last Adam. There will be third, fourth, and myriads of men because Christ is the second man. But he's not the second Adam. He's the last Adam. He's the head of a new race. Now, that is something we want to say that's preliminary. 
And as you go through this section, you'll notice an expression that is very meaningful. It is much more. What he's going to say is, we have much more in Christ than we lost in Adam. And that expression was way back in verse 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, there's a great deal of much more in this section here. Now, let's look at this again. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, death came by Adam. And if you want proof that the first sin of Adam was a representative act, and I said a moment ago that we could prove it, that one act of Adam brought death to the human family. You say, I thought my sin did it. Oh, no. Have you ever stopped to think of why a little infant will die and a little infant hasn't committed a sin? That is a sinful act. Well, that little infant belongs to the race of Adam. In Adam, all die. You see, God didn't intend man to die. God had something better in store for man and does today. Now, with that thought in mind, let's move into this section. In verse 13, I read, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Now, that is from Adam to Moses, sin was in the world. But at that time, sin was not a transgression. It was merely rebellion against God. And I think this is the reason God did not exact the death penalty from Cain when he murdered his brother. I can't think of a deed more dastardly than that. But God had not said, thou shalt not kill. And actually, God put a mark on Cain to protect him. And you find that a little later on that one of the sons of Cain, Lamech, tells why he killed a man. He says, I've slain a man to my wounding, a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. You see, Lamech had a reason. And then that generation that was destroyed at the flood, it was saturated with sin. They were incurable, incorrigible. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's in Genesis 6, 5. But not one of them broke the Ten Commandments because there wasn't any Ten Commandments then. But they were judged because they were sinners. And friends, that's the reason whether you've heard the gospel or not. And that answers the question about the heathen today that haven't heard. The whole question is that we belong to a lost race. That's difficult for you and me to accept. But you and I have been born into a lost race. We're not a lovely people. We're not the product of evolution onward and upward forever, and everything is getting better. It's not. You and I belong to a lost race, and we need to be redeemed. Even the very thought life of man is alienated from God. And somebody says, well, I think that God then today is obligated to save all of us. No, he's not. Suppose that you could go down to an old marshy lake covered with scum, and you take a turtle out of there, and there are hundreds of turtles in that lake, and you teach this turtle to fly. And this turtle goes down and says to the other turtles, wouldn't you like to learn to fly? I think they'd laugh at the turtle. They'd say, no, we like it down here. We don't want to fly. And that's the condition of lost man today. Men don't want to be saved. That's not the condition of men. Men are lost, alienated from God. Now, that's a great truth. That's so difficult for it to soak in the minds of all of us because we have that lost nature. We just love to think that we're wonderful people and we're not friends. Now notice verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now what Paul is doing here, he personifies death. And he speaks of the fact that death reigned like a king from Adam to Moses, but they hadn't broken the Ten Commandments. They weren't given, you see. It was not transgression, but man was a sinner. Now, actually, death is used in a threefold way in Scripture. There's what is known as physical death. That refers only to the body, and it means a separation of the spirit from the body. And this death comes because of Adam's sin. Now, there's spiritual death. That's separation from and rebellion against God. And we inherit this nature from Adam. We're alienated from God. We're dead in trespasses and sins. That's the picture that Scripture presents. 
The Lord Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that heareth my word, though he were dead. And that used to disturb me. How could he be dead and hear? Well, they're spiritually dead. That is separated from God. Then eternal death. That's the second death the Scripture speaks of. And that's eternal separation from God. And unless man is redeemed, this inevitably follows. And I should say this is the third. Now, Adam is definitely here declared to be a type of Christ, who is the figure, as I have it. He's the type of him who was to come. That is, Adam is a type of Christ. And so said ye. Now, listen to verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For it, through the offense of one, many be dead. Now, listen to this. Much more. You get much more in Christ. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto men. Now he's presenting here. You see the headship of Christ. We have much more in Christ, and we today are looking forward to something more wonderful than the Garden of Eden. We're told in Hebrews 11:13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. What a wonderful thing. Verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses under justification. Now, I recognize this is a difficult passage of Scripture. This is one of those very difficult passages. Now, all this section simply means this. One transgression plunged the race into sin. One act of obedience and the death of Christ upon the cross makes it possible for lost man to be saved. And he presents to us, therefore, actually here, two kingdoms. And in verse 18... I read, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Now, verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. These are the two kingdoms that are presented to us. There is the kingdom of death. That's Adam's. We belong to that. And Adam all died. Then there is that one of life, the Lamb's book of life. Are you written in it? And these are the two kingdoms. Death reigns over one, Christ over the other. He is the one that gives life today. Notice verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And you notice, when God gave the law, he gave with it a sacrificial system. And then later on, Christ came to fulfill that part of it, too. In other words, God has given to the human race, a lost race, an opportunity to be delivered from the guilt of sins and not the nature of sin. Now, you and I will have that until we die. Now, will you notice that we come to the last verse of this very difficult section, verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death. You see, you and I are living in a world today where sin reigns. You want to know who's the king of the earth today? Satan is the prince. He's the one that goes up and down the earth seeking whom he may devour. That's Peter 5, 8. Sin hath reigned unto death, and the cemeteries are still being filled because of that. Now, he says, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And he's calling out a people today, out of a lost race, and he's teaching turtles to fly if they want to. That's no reflection on the turtles that don't want to because it's their nature They're alienated. Man is alienated from God, and that's our nature. Now, God offers salvation to a lost race. This is the tremendous subject of imputation of sin, and it's actually potential sanctification. It's on this foundation that God now will seek not only to save man from the guilt of sin, but to make mankind that trusts him 
free to deliver them that they can live from God. We'll see that next time. Dr. McGee covered a lot of important truth today. If you'd like to listen to today's message again or share it with a friend, visit us at ttb.org. Or even better, order one of our five-year flash drives or our solar Bible bus and have every study right in the palm of your hand. We'd love to tell you more about it, so call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now be sure to join us tomorrow as we continue to make our way through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.